Hello, everybody, and welcome to another Hollywood experience. And um, I have David Bethke in the outskirts of going, Hollywood. Adrian? What's that? What's that? How, how's it going? Good, good. We've we've actually not been speaking for a while. You were actually off. I actually had Ethan Detmar come in and and have to uh, take care of things while you were you were busy. How, you you've been kind of how, doing stuff, haven't you? It's been very busy. Yes, it's just been very busy. I've been bouncing around, as you said, Hollywood, uh, doing a whole bunch of stuff. Um, I'm also excited about who we're going to be talking to uh, coming up because uh, as soon as you told me who it was, I was just like, oh wow, that's a bit of my job. <laughs> do you want to? Uh, do a bit of an introduction yeah mike chat mike uh mike and i met actually uh while his wife was doing a film with me uh okay. called christmas murder story um okay it was uh, a, a you know a fun thing i did um a christmas crime story not murder story christmas crime story um mm-hmm. that we did a few years ago downtown los angeles and i met mike and you know he he uh uh I, I found out who he was and you know he's a brilliant um martial artist he's done he's been in the martial art hall of fame he's been uh, doing choreography and he's and he's rehearsed and and taught so many different uh actors and uh, stunt performers that uh, mm-hmm. i had to sort of reach out to him and say listen you've got to talk to us on the show and he graciously <laughs> said yeah okay we'll do it and um you know so he came on and uh, we had a, a really nice chat very different chat than i've had with some other people oh, cool. because um you know sometimes it's stories but i like the philosophy side that mike brings to things um yeah we kind of share the same cool. type of ideas as well so um yeah and of course he paid power ranger so which is what, <laughs> what, what you liked wasn't it that's what uh yes that, I, I, he, he was a power ranger long after i stopped watching the show but still it's cool to have him connected in some way to that yeah well listen let's let's get on to that interview because i know we don't have a huge amount of time doing stuff so um without further ado um this was me uh talking with mike and uh, some of the really cool things that we uh we uh, chatted about hello welcome everybody uh yes it's been a couple of weeks since we've actually been on air it's been so many things we've been doing so far but uh, i've got a great guest today uh f- well current former a uh, world champion in martial artist, uh, martial art hall of famer, Mike Chat. Am I? Did I get that right? Yeah. <laughs> did I get yes, that right? Yeah. I mean, you know, I don't learn these things. I just got the information, and it just kind of comes out. Yes. Well, I, I'm, I'm definitely a martial artist, and and I did my competing, and um, it's it, it's been quite a journey. Uh, like you know, as a martial, a lifelong martial artist, and teaching, and being an instructor, and passing on the knowledge. It's it's. Uh, it's a great way to live your life and, and to experience things, um, you know, in, in relationships and business. And uh, it's a lot of fun. So I'm excited to be here with you. So, so wh- when did you start your martial arts career? Um, you know, I, I look at that in terms of, you know, my, my life and my lifestyle. So in my head, my career started when I was a little kid watching voice dub Kung Fu movies <laughs> with my dad, because that's what I wanted to do. I just wanted to do martial arts, fly through the air, do, you know, fight with swords and, and all kinds of crazy Kung Fu stuff, land in super cool poses. And uh, that, that was my dream. So, you know, starting martial arts and getting into competition and then eventually transitioning into Hollywood. Um, that was That was always in my mind. So I feel like the career and the dream started when I was a kid. Um, you know, I, I, I did my first little uh, extra role in a movie when I was like 10 years old, but then really, you know, kickstarted it after winning my first world title and coming to Hollywood back, um, back when I was 18, 19 years old. So, so you bounce just as well as you did when you were 10? <laughs> well, you know, some things change as you get older. <laughs> That's what I, I, I watch my son. You know, my son plays soccer and does martial arts. He does sword and stuff. And you know, I take him on a couple of the videos, uh, structural videos. And the way he's stretching and bouncing down, I'm like, oh my gosh, I can't do that anymore. <laughs> it's mm-hmm. just, it's entirely different. Has it changed the way you actually approach things now? Oh, absolutely. You know, everyone used to tell me, oh, when you hit thirty, things are going to change, and I was like, nope, nope. But uh, but they definitely do. You know, the amount of time that you have to train and and, and put into it while you're working and, and raising a family and running your businesses, uh, you know, traveling and uh, on and off planes and doing events, then uh, it takes its toll. So definitely changes the approach. Uh, have to be more focused about, you know, your stretching and your mental and physical health. 
And it's, it's something that uh, has been great for me in terms of being much more in tune with my body and, and how it works, what it responds to in, in relation to then being able to pass on this knowledge to other students. Do you think it's important uh, in weapons as it is in martial arts to be as physically fit to do that type of uh, uh, workout, if you like? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, the weapons are any, any weapon. It's just in, in a traditional sense, it's just an extension of the body. Right. And so in order to have the awareness, the, the safety, the control, you know, first and foremost, and then to be able to you know, wield the weapon, especially one like the sword, uh, you have to have control over all different aspects of your mind and body. So, you know, to, to lack on the, you know, the, the physical conditioning side is, is going to take away from, you know, your, your training of the techniques and definitely the performance, whether it's just, you know, doing simple techniques, cuts, strikes with the weapon and, or doing actual fight choreography. Do you think there is a correlation between um, I kind of have a discussion on this. I'm kind of curious as to your, your um, opinion on it. Do you think there's a, there's a correlation between what we do in everyday life when we train as a martial artist or train with swords? Is there, are there things that benefit us in everyday life from doing those types of things? Well, absolutely. I mean, uh, that, yeah, I would love to hear your take on it. <laughs> but that, that is, that is the essence of what, you know, the Zen of martial arts is all about, right? Mind, body, spirit. And, you know, the, when, when you really get into it, the, the philosophies are very similar. And that's why, you know, we, we can help others by applying the philosophies that we, you know, we, we learn, we embody, we train and we teach in martial arts, you know, to your everyday life, right? You know, developing focus with, you know, with using a martial arts weapon, yes, it's for safety, right? But developing strong focus uh, and, and with that, you must have, you know, and, and are constantly developing your discipline and self-discipline and awareness. The, these things are, are, are essential in, in living your life and being able to, you know, go after the goals that you want and stay centered and grounded, you know, especially when things throw you off, especially when, you know, you're in the middle of a worldwide pandemic that is, hmm. that is uh, like the one that we're in now and, and being able to weather all of the ups and downs and, you know, the traumas that go with it. Um, so, yeah, for sure. You know, one of the things uh, you asked about my idea, I, I, I totally agree with you. It's one of the things I'm constantly telling people when we do events and when I do uh, the uh, private uh, videos that we do. Um, it's basically everyday life. It's something as simple as picking something up from the floor or, um, you know, going to reach for your baby or doing things like that. When you're doing stretching from martial arts, that keeps your body in tune to do those types of things. And you mentioned the point, point about the pandemic. Pandemic to me uh, runs by one of the core statements I tell people, which is I, I found the statement a while ago and, and, I, and I kind of like to say this and I was saying it just before the pandemic started, which is for a, for a species to survive, it has nothing to do with their intelligence or strength, but it has to do with their ability to adapt. And I think mm -hmm. adapting right now is one of the key things and adapting in martial arts and in fights is another key thing because you mm -hmm. can't say, well, I do this style. Therefore, that's the only thing I'm going to do, because if somebody comes at you in a different way, if you're not adapting, you're going to lose. So right. I, th I think there's th that's kind of my philosophy, if you like, there's an being able to adapt in things and being able to move from one thing to another. Yeah. You know, it's funny that you say that um, <laughs> so many similarities, but, but this specific example, um, I, of course, I, you know, I work with martial artists and students, but then we have this mentor group for actors and stunt professionals. And, and we started this whole pandemic in terms of shifting by, by looking at these two concepts when it, when it comes to, you know, well, what are you going to do now? You know, the world is in disarray, so much uncertainty. Everybody's, you know, swirling in their, 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 their heads. What are we going to do for work financially? What's going to happen with the industry? How are we going to get through this? And we, we talk about it in terms of strategic versus adaptive plan, right? And it's, it, it comes from the military, but, but also martial arts, military arts, where, uh, as you know, you know, the best way to go about anything is, is to have a strategic plan, is to, is to plan it out drill it, practice it, and then you execute. But when you're thrown off, when there's something like a curveball or a worldwide pandemic, then you have to be flexible. You have to adapt. And, and then having the adaptive plan 
is so important because if you didn't pivot during this time, whether you're a martial arts business owner, school owner, teacher, um, and entertainer, then, then you would have been stuck, right? And so being able to adapt is really the key and all, all of that when it comes to flexibility and, and applying that, not, not in the body, but flexibility in one's mindset, mm -hmm. right? And the ability to then shift and pivot. Um, yeah, we, we, we've talked about those concepts so much over the last year because they directly relate to uh, the situation now that everybody's going through and what can be very, very helpful, right? But those who are not able to adapt, that were not flexible and they couldn't pivot or they struggle with it, right? They're, they're stuck in their ways or it's hard for them to get out of that mindset, then it makes it very difficult for them. Yeah, agreed. So let's talk about the first time you went on a film set because, you know, obviously you've choreographed, you've done the martial arts, you've been on film. What, what was it, what, what, how did you get onto your first film set and what was it like for you? Well, my very first film set, I was an extra. Uh, I was a kid. My instructor, uh, Sensei Sharky, out of uh, Sharky's Karate Studios in Naperville, Illinois. Was, know, that was, fight, was that Fight Zone? No, that way it was before that. So Fight Zone when I was 18. Right. Okay. Um, this, uh, I don't even know if this is on my IMDb. Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, I was just a little extra. And um, it was freezing cold. It was snowing. It was in Chicago. And um, all I remember was just the excitement, the feeling. And uh, I waited all day and somewhere around four or five o'clock in the evening after it got dark, I ran up to a window to see what was going on. And uh, there, was, there was some violence fighting going on inside. And uh, they just needed a shot of this little kid running up to the window, seeing what was going on and then running away. That was, that, that was it. And um, that was my first experience. But what, what I believe many people experience uh, their first time of anything is just the feeling, you know, mm -hmm. that they walk away with. And from there, I knew, you know, looking back now, like how insignificant and how like normal that is to do, to do uh, background work and to have a little role in a, in, a, in a, you know, bigger production, you know, how normal that can be. But for me and my first experience, I don't think I've ever talked about this, by the way, <laughs> in an interview, ah. because nobody's ever framed a question like that. But, but looking back, yeah, that was, that was it. That gave me so much motivation. What do you, what do you think? What do you think it is? What do you think it drives people? Because I, I know the first time I saw a certain scene in acting, I knew that's exactly what I wanted to do. There was a feeling that made me go, this is it. This is what I want. I don't know what, what made me, it was some connection, but what yeah, was it for absolutely. you? Absolutely. Well, because, because I didn't really get to see the scene and what was going on inside the window, all, all I experienced was this feeling of, okay, this is real. Like, I'm starting the process. This is what my dream was. I wanted to do it. Here I am. I'm going to get paid. Of course, it wasn't very much, especially back then, but I'm going to be in a movie, right? So that, that was enough. That was enough for me. Even even now, like worldwide, people get an opportunity to then just audition for something. It's like, whoa, that sparks. It's so powerful. The, the, the power of your mindset and, you know, always being told that, you know, you can do whatever you want. I had great parents, I had great mentors in my life, especially my instructor, who was my, my biggest advocate at the time for, you know, pushing for, for entertainment work, you know, at such a young age when he didn't have any other students that said they wanted to do movies at that time. So, so it really was powerful for me and um, the, the feeling of actually doing it. For me, it was everything. Obviously, for those people, you know, I'm sure there are other extras that, it, that, that had done a lot of you know, background work before. Um, it was normal for them. For me, it was the first. It was, uh, it was a major moment that then just lit the fire you know, that, that continued to burn. Where, where, where were you at this stage? You know, what, what city were you living in? Where were you born? You're, so, you're Thai, you're part Thai, correct? Or you're full yes, Thai. I was actually born in Thailand. Uh, my parents were there visiting, um, brought me back to the Chicago area when I was two months old. I was living in Naperville, Illinois, uh, a Western suburb of the city. And so that's where I grew up. And I was training in martial arts. I was, I was newer. I was within like my first two years of training. And uh, this opportunity came up. 
And so you that, this was when you were about 14, you said? Uh, I think I was younger, like 12. 12. Okay. So between yeah. 12 and 18, when you did your first role, did you, ju- did you do any more? Was there any more exciting moments like that for you? Or was was like yeah. the, 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 the 18, the one that, you know, sealed the deal? Yeah, no, that, that was it until, you know, then my whole plan was then to move out to California, uh, go to school. Uh, originally it was UCLA, but then I wound up going up to San Jose state and then transferring down to UCLA. And, um, and so basically the, my whole focus was then to graduate high school, get to Hollywood and start pursuing this dream. My backup was, you know, to major in business and, and go to business school and open up martial arts schools. And so the goal was to do that. And then the opportunity for Fight Zone came, came along and um, uh, a local Chicago competitor, Spitfire Brown, he was older than me. So he kind of chaperoned me uh, as I was just turning 18, maybe I was 17 actually, um, flew out to LA and we did had no idea what to expect. Didn't even know that we, were, we needed to put together our own fight choreography, nothing, nothing. We were going to, to do this show and uh, they gave us zero information. So that was quite the experience having to just show up and they're like, you know, what kind of fight are you guys gonna do? What's your character name? Like we, we had no idea we had to create our own character names and nothing. It was crazy. So, so how was it going from like martial art fighting, you know, what you'd learn to then having to choreograph something, you know, because obviously choreographing it and, and doing a fight is a little bit different. Yeah. Uh, it was terrifying. Didn't know anything. And actually now, now that I'm remembering correctly, we came out to Los Angeles to audition for the show. What we didn't know was that they were taking people that they liked from the auditions and that day bringing them back in the afternoon to then choreograph and film. That's what it was. Now that I remember correctly. That's rather fast. Yeah. So, so no, what I remember was I met, sort of met, ran into Nils Stewart. And Nils Stewart, many years later, I wind up training his son, Boo Boo Stewart and Fievel um, before he did X-Men and he was already doing some Disney stuff, but I started training him. So Nils was this massive, I don't know, six, three, six, four, you know, fighter, long hair, shaved head, Mongolian ponytail. And he had this whole fight scene choreographed with another guy. We watched this and we were like, uh, wow, that looks like- 